and people ask me when I go home, you know, where I where I am, you know, and I, instead of saying in a approved school, I'm saying therapeutic community, and they don't know what the hell you're on about. Yeah. And you, you tell them about it, you know, some people laugh, you know, think, think I'm on holiday. But I think if they come here, they find it much different. It can get really tough sometimes. As stately homes go, this one in Surrey is rather more useful and probably more interesting than most in modern Britain. It was for 20 years until 1970 an approved school. Here, juvenile delinquents, as they were called, were exposed to a moral code and a trade training, which any enlightened stately homeowner of the last century might have considered a very proper education for children of the less fortunate classes, delinquent or not. The place had a good record within the approved school system. Then, three years ago, there was a sort of palace revolution here, conducted by the Board of Governors and a nucleus of staff. Today, the entire population of the place, boys and staff, prepare to show the world what has happened here during the last three years. 400 guests have been asked to come and judge for themselves the results of the revolution. They will be given drinks, lectures, lunch, and their questions will be answered. Many of the visitors will want to know how the place works, because three years ago it ceased to be a recognizable institution in the traditional sense. Its address was changed from Park House to its ancient Saxon name, Pepper Harrow. The old system of rewards and penalties for good or bad behaviour was junked. The punishment book was closed. And in the last three years, the population, staff and boys, has changed out of all recognition. What does Pepper Harrow look like to its boys today? This place is it, you know. It's real. They actually do try and help. Yeah? You know, a lot of people um, think we're a load of naughty boys, you know. They should be punished. Yeah, they should be punished, whipped, isn't it? But... I think the staff here realise that we're people, you know, not just Numbers. naughty little boys. You know, and that, they try and help you. But really, you come here to help yourself, you know, not for somebody to help you. How do you reckon you get that sort of message across by having 400 people here, though? I mean, do you mingle with them? Yeah. You know? yeah. They, when, they, when they come around, they're all shown round. And it could be just lost on them. They just may think it's maybe just a day eight and have a look at some sort of crackpot idea which is going on in Surrey. But we, we hope that the majority, the majority of people is just going to take it away from good points of view. Because you can't... Say a bloke has been working in the prison service for the past, say, 20 years. I Personally, myself, I don't think if he came to 200 conferences, it would make much difference to him. Part of the philosophy which goes behind Pepper Harrow comes from a very wide spectrum of sources. And so if you see something that sounds familiar to you, but appears to be a twisted version... The conference is addressed by Pepper Harrow's director, Melvin Rose. I hope, but it is our fault and nothing to do with them whatsoever. I'm sure they'd want me to say this. In specialists' jargon, Pepper Harrow is a therapeutic community. In fact, it's an alternative to traditional methods of helping disturbed adolescents, an alternative of interest to every taxpayer, since each boy costs about £3,000 a year, wherever he's sent for help. This is Marcus. I said you bring him That's right, yes. yes. So you'll have to ask her. She was supposed to come up and see me yesterday. Yeah. She didn't come. She was hoping to come today. About a weekend. As the child soon becomes aware that all those gods, like adults, that have been put on the mantelpiece, yeah. um, you know, suffer from hangovers, have rows with their wives when they fling things at them. Now, beef fart means something to me. Who's <laughs> beef fart? <laughs> you don't know who beef fart is? Yeah. It's the finest musician ever walked the earth. Do you realise that? Yeah. Who do you think? Stone. Who? Stone. 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 
This elegant banquet proves that Pepper Harrow can rise to an occasion. But what's it like for the rest of the year? Food is prepared and cooked for up to 50 boys by the boys. It is plentiful and exceedingly plain. Tea and coffee are always on tap. Nobody has to ask for a cup. <laughs> John Bentley, an American, is a new boy. All new boys are interviewed by members of staff and also by the boys. If his face doesn't fit with them, it's unlikely he'll be admitted. There are very few rules. Boys are encouraged to do as they wish. On the face of it, few demands are made of them. Nobody here pretends that women don't exist. The boys don't have to get up for breakfast, make their beds, tidy their rooms, pick up their clothes, or get off their backs if they don't want to. The classrooms and workshops of an earlier regime are empty and silent. Soon they will be studios and lecture theatres. Here, boys in school clothes used to learn a trade. But now there are no set classes. Boys dress as they wish, study, but only if they want to. In the past three years, the general character of the population has changed considerably. Boys now come to Pepper Harrow from child guidance clinics, are sent by doctors, or arrive under a care order. Today, only about 50% have broken the law, one way or another. All may be described, if such labels have meaning, as disturbed adolescents. A far cry from a total population of uniformed juvenile delinquents. Boys may miss breakfast if they wish, but everybody, including the 20 staff, must attend the community meeting at 9.15 a.m. Here, the collective strength of the community is expressed. Here, the individual finds his relationship to others. Here, each may discover an effective interest in his own destiny and have his say in the running of the community. Here, no holds are barred. What, uh, what the hell is it we're talking about as far as making conference concerned? Because there isn't much time. Straight after Christmas, me and Mike was about the same. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> sort of, he was here one day and I was here one day. And we was both gone again. Right, and during that time, I don't think Mike's had too much attention to me. Here, the popular criticisms of therapeutic communities, that they are merely permissive, lack or effective control of individuals, or any educational direction, are, according to this community, disproved. Well, all you can say is what you feel about it now. <laughs> Pepper Harrow is looked after by staff and boys. If one doesn't do his proper task, it's discussed at the morning meeting. In just the same way, outbreaks of violence, theft, drunkenness are discussed openly, in detail and to the point. What makes this possible is a community that can withstand and survive behaviour which may wreck families, horrify neighbours, summon the law. It is this process of open discussion the boys refer to as being tougher than punishment. When the revolution began, with institutionalised boys inherited from the traditional system, the risks were enormous. We had about seven arsonists, um, and nobody knew that they were. I mean, you, people get caught for a tiny proportion of what they actually do, and only then if they're unlucky. Um, so here we had um, about seven arsonists who were set in a situation with no controls, where they could only behave the way they felt, and suddenly we got outbreaks of fires all over the place. The fire brigade knew the way to Pepper Harrow very uh, well. Um, I remember one night it had reached the situation where we'd had about ten fires in about a month and a half. Most of these had occurred during the day. Many of them were beginning to occur at late evening when people were beginning to go to bed. But it reached, I think, its worst point. I remember we had to evacuate the building at about 11.30 at night. They, the, um, we had a fire, I can't, remember, I can't remember where it was, anyway, the details are not, not uh, important. But the business of evacuating the building with kids that by this time were very, very anxious was appalling. Many of them were in tears, and this was still the days when they believed that, you know, men did not cry under any circumstances. You didn't feel upset, you were hard enough to take anything. And there were these kids breaking down, 
and th there were the staff filing them out of the building, and we went over to another building, and everybody sat on the floor, and I think felt really at rock bottom. You, thought, you know, what the hell was the point in going on? The insecurity was absolutely immense, and it was a pathetic situation always round. Eventually, we managed to isolate um, many of them. Many of them isolated themselves. They couldn't stand the situation, and they insisted on leaving. What about the selection of staff? Surely there must be as much attention paid to that as to the selection of boys, if not more. Um, what we really want is people that are aware of their own limitations and their own problems and their own difficulties, and they're aware of them at sufficiently a sensitive level to have learned to recognize them when they begin to operate and to know how to live in this sort of world despite their own difficulties. Dr. Nora Murrow was at Pepper Harrow for 12 years before 1970 as a consultant psychiatrist. Then she saw only those boys who were referred to her, not in group therapy sessions, nor in their ordinary clothes, but singly in school uniform. And not all of the staff then were in favour of head shrinkers. Before 1970, the boys existed in a clearly defined situation of punishment for breaking rules and absence of punishment for conforming. For the boys, it was a simple, if not very interesting option, demanding little initiative, offering little involvement, beyond beating the system or being beaten. Yes, I think they felt then that they had a straight choice. They could either conform or rebel. Um, and in either case, they knew approximately what to expect. But whichever they did, uh, they had a limited personal responsibility. Uh, there, there was a certain pattern of behavior which was prescribed and if they chose to follow it then the whole day followed relatively simply. What's the life for a boy who leaves that kind of school when the school hasn't taught him that regimentation and obeying the rules is more rewarding when he emerges a rebel? What's his future outlook? Catastrophic, really because he goes back into a situation which in itself hasn't improved, may have deteriorated, certainly is still complicated for him, and he has no inner strengths or resources um, other than the ones that originally failed him with which to meet the recurring dilemma. Both the term and out in the world. Mm. Mm. What would you say are the differences in objective between uh, an approved school and a therapeutic community. Let's start with the approved school. What does the approved school set out to do? Um, to train boys, um, I think most good approved schools felt they offered two kinds of training. One was trade training, and uh, a very great deal of emphasis was placed on this. The argument, which was reasonable, was that if a boy hasn't got the skill to earn his living, then you can't be too surprised if he tries to steal his living. So clearly this was a, a first um, priority, that he should be taught the skills so that he could. Um, the regimentation, um, I think, was an attempt to impose a kind of character training in the hope that he would be receptive to this. Uh, and as I say, there probably were some boys for whom this was sufficient, adequate. Now, what are the aims of a therapeutic community? I wish it wasn't called a therapeutic community. It's such a difficult term, but... Yes, we wish that too. We're trying to think of some alternative. H have you come up, uh, across another phrase that's more... Uh... Not really. It's quite difficult to think of something that puts it in a nutshell. The aim really is to give it's an opportunity, an environment in which they can um, grow. And this means not imposing behavior on them, nor does it simply mean tolerating their bad behavior. But um, while having the capacity to tolerate the bad behavior, nevertheless gently pressurizing them to the point where they have to recognize it and consider its meaning and be prepared to commit themselves to the effort to change it out of their head of steam, not somebody else's. Can you tell us Today, with members of staff and a psychiatrist, all the boys meet in small groups for one and a half hours a week.
Philip is a new boy, he's 15. This is his first psychotherapy group. He may be aware that this group are interested in him and will understand much of what he will say as they encourage him to talk about his situation, to try to understand it, to overcome his past. His mother, who herself had a disturbed adolescence, who left him for the first time when he was three. The system, which has had him in and out of institutions since then. His anxiety for the younger children of his family. Right now, he's feeling pretty angry with his mother for abandoning them. That's okay. He, he wouldn't accept it. We got this letter, you see, about from this investigation department. And what said that she had no intentions of returning. And, uh, and that she felt the kids could be cared better than what she could do for them where they were. You know, I thought she was a bit of a coward running out on me. She also ran out on you? Not really on me, because I was in this home. Well, it, well, she did really run out on me, but mostly it matters about the younger ones, really, I think. Because I'm old enough to know about that. But the others can't accept it, really. And I, I don't know what I'd do if I seen it. I might just tell you, no shout at her. Might even punch her on her nose. Pretty angry. Pardon? You're pretty yeah, angry with her. Not pretty, very mm. angry with her. To Philip's consternation, the local council, in order to help Philip's family and his overworked father, sent a mother's help to run the home. And he likes this old dragon. I don't think she's horrible. I'm not sure how much contact you've had with this dragon. Really? Only one day, and she gave me. She was in the house for about an hour, brewing herself, drinking herself silly, and all. You know, with tea, not booze. She don't drink. She don't smoke. She was too much like an angel. What you feel about leave when you feel you're going home to this dragon? I don't know, praying on the train that I don't meet her. Hope she gets sat by the time we get there. Ah, but I shouldn't hope that because that's a chance for the kids to come home. He's got to settle for something for the best of the kids because at the moment I'm not the most important thing. He's got three other people to think about. The three other children. You said that earlier. You said it's more important about the little ones. It is. But why isn't it important about how you feel? Um? Why isn't it important about how you feel? It is important, but it's more important for the children, the other ones, to get a chance to get on, because they haven't been in trouble and they've got to learn not to get in trouble and not get in position like I'm in, getting sent away every other week. This day brings you your birth and brings you your death. Uh, unless you still wrap up your words in riddles. Were you not famed for your skill at solving riddles? Who taunt me with a gift that is my great... Steve, at 17, has chosen to begin study again with one of the staff whose classical education equipped him to tutor Steve in the subject of his choice. Steve, who ran away from Pepper Harrow about 50 times to begin with and came back of his own accord, has now taken O-levels in Greek literature. But, as presently shall appear a Theban born to his cost, he that came seeing blind shall go, rich now, then a beggar stick in hand, groping his way to a land of exile. What is it about ancient Greek literature and the civilization of that time that interests you, Steve? <laughs> uh, I don't really... Uh, I sort of... Um, I get enjoyment from reading it. Uh, I don't know, really. Some people get enjoyment from their music. They're English. I get enjoyment from Greek. I don't really know what it is. I think it's... Uh, there's, uh, I think there's a lot of excitement in it as well, and a lot of relevance as well to sort of nowadays as well. Can I ask you, and you don't have to answer me if you don't want to, what kind of trouble you'd been in that led to you coming to Pepperhara? Oh, um, breaking an entry and things like that. It started from when I was about ten, I suppose. I never went to school, and I got supervision sort of thing, and then I got probation, probation, and I got uh, built up to a pro school. I got a sort of indefinite period. And I didn't, I thought, well, I'm going to a pro school, you know, but I came to her eventually, so I was quite lucky, really. 
not easy, really. It's quite difficult because of the actual, you know, things you have to understand to sort of uh, be a... The actual choice you make to be here is your choice, so you realise that you've got to uh, make a go of it, you know? Try to understand. What does it mean, making a go of things at Pepper Harrow? Because it's not the same as making a go of things in other kinds of institutions. Well, no, um, I think if you went to a Peru school, you, you do what they tell you, you know? That's it, you're stuck in a regimented place, but um, when you come here, you're uh, doing something for yourself, sort of thing. You're actually trying to make a go out of your own life, you know, whereas you haven't been able to before. Now, if you realise that your case isn't sort of uh, isolated, you know, your actual problems and things, then I think that helps you quite a lot. And so therefore you can, uh, you know, s resolve things which you, n you never thought you had, you know. Mm -hmm. you know, If you nicked, you nicked, you know. There was nothing behind it. You, you just nicked, so that was it. Martin, now 16, Sorry. came to Pepper Harrow 18 months Sorry. ago. He embarked on adolescence as a skinhead, complete with flick knife, boots and a taste for brawling when he was drunk, which happened regularly. When sober, he thought vaguely about working on the land for a living. When he came to Pepper Harrow under a care order, he acquired Snowy, which must be the best cared for pedigree goat in the home counties. Martin's main offences were drunkenness, fighting, stealing and breaking and entering. Soon after Martin was born, his father, an alcoholic, left home. He came back occasionally, then vanished again. At home, Martin felt somewhat isolated and at 12 or 13 began to drink to numb his misery. Getting drink was no problem to him. Yeah, well, at first it was easy, you know, until the cops started going around turning all the off licences and that, and they used to get me mates to drink. Mm. And then there was this kid at school who I used to sort of, like, you know, threaten it because his dad used to own this place, you know. But off licence shop or a no, pub or what? Uh, pu a pub, a club, yeah. you know. I used to threaten him, you know, if you don't give me... If you don't nick a bottle of whiskey, I'll beat you up. <laughs> and I Did he believe you? Yeah, well, I used to give him two threatening punches now and again just to make sure. You uh, did? Yeah. Yeah. And so I was just threatening him, you know. And uh, so I just ended up coughing up half the time. But I, I used to get loads of money, you know. From whom? Pocket money? No, I used to um, knock, you know, knock loads of money off from places and. I used to knock a lot, loads of booze off and things like this, you know, so I was, I was never out of drink, never. We sit here and we kind of laugh about it, but uh, what do you really think about it? Do you think it was altogether a laughing matter? No, at the time, you know, I was dead hysterical. We laughed about it all. Yeah. You know, I was always laughing about it, but at the time, you know, I really hated having to do it, but I found that, you know, I just did have to do it, you know, to get the money for booze. So what happened when you finally got picked up by the police and, uh, and they decided that something had to be done? Well, it was when I nicked uh, uh, a leather, a red leather... <laughs> this is another laugh, <laughs> really. <laughs> there was a red leather uh, coat at school and I was going to put some flares in my jeans that day. And just for a laugh, you know, I thought, yeah, I'll do it, you know, I'll just be an idiot. And there's this red leather coat hanging up. And so I thought, right, I'll cut two triangles out the back of it. <laughs> it's a brand new coat. I thought, right, I'll cut two triangles out the back of it and leave it hanging there. <laughs> and put, but in the end, I just nicked it and took it home and cut it up into little pieces. You know, I went home and cut it up into little pieces. And then the feds were after me next day. That's so why I went out, I had to go around and switch feds. <laughs> you know, and they said, you know, where's this coat at? And so I had to admit to it in the end because somebody grasped me up, you know. And they said, Somebody told on you? Yeah. Who? Well, the lad who I did it with, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this is bring it round. When I took it round, it was in a little brown bag. <laughs> and then when I went to court, it was on the court table, all cut up into little pieces. <laughs> and I had to go and see a psychiatrist after that. But before you came here, Martin, did you think that you were the only guy who had your particular problems and nobody else in the world did? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did just think that, yeah. Because I didn't really... Because I never really got down in, into any emotional sort of conversation with anybody, you know. It was always sort of like... I was always in... Joking, you know, I was always, you know, joking about, you know, I was always in a hysterical sort of moods, laughing all the time, and this sort of thing, you know. Putting up a front? Putting up a front, that was it, you know. No, nobody ever got to see me in real self, so I never really discussed anything with anybody else. So, in that kind of situation, you must have felt a bit lonely, I suppose. Yeah, I was hellish lonely, you know. I, you know, it was sort of like a lot of us, you know, and they sort of, sort of, you know, sort of looked up to me as being, you know, sort of like the idiot, and sort of like this, sort of like, you know, 
tough guy sort of thing, you know, oh, you know, come on, let's go with him, you know, he's going to do something, you know, let's go for, with him for a drink, you know, let's see him perform, you know. <laughs> and really, and if people were looking from the outside looking at me, they would have thought, you know, oh, loads of friends, you know, great geezer. But really, you know, he's the loneliest person on the earth. Do you feel much less lonely here? Yeah, yeah. You know, but when I go home, I feel, still feel pretty lonely, you know, with people, because, you know, you have a completely different sort of relationship with other people on the outside. I mean, you know, you just don't, you know, people don't really understand, you know, about you know, anything, you know. I mean, it's a bit too much for them, really. I think, you know. Too much in what sense? You mean it's well, too difficult for them to grasp? Yeah, I, too difficult for them to understand, I think. And also, I think, I mean, most people, it does get pretty close to them, I think. Most, you know, sort of people. I think so, anyway. But most lads who I try, ever try to get to talk to, you know, they, you know, I tell them, you know, tell them sort of like what this place really does, you know. Say love and care into them and they shudder in their pants, you know. <laughs> At moments of crisis, and they are plentiful here, the strength of the community is put to the test. Those boys who understand its value show remarkable solidarity and good sense. The others observe, learn and ultimately help. This crisis concerns Martin. He returned from a miserable weekend at home with some money. One of the boys, in sympathy with Martin's bad mood, went out with him and bought three bottles of sherry. When they'd gone, he gave more money to Martin, who set off for a pub. There was a brawl, a damaged car, and right now five people are having trouble holding Martin down on the grass outside, while everyone else gathers round the fire in the hall to sort out the situation. And we get into this terrible hassle. And we come out of it and we have a situation like this. But the results of this situation we don't know. And it can be someone's life. And we're always travelling on this hair breadth here, on this tightrope. And that's how it has to be if we're to be reasonably free to be able to be as we feel. But at the same time, when you have a situation like this, this is intolerable and it's unacceptable and it's beyond the limit. The damage it's going to do to Martin is enormous. And when I say the chances are he could never recover from it, I mean it. Start caring about it when it's too bloody late. Right. Now look, first of all, let's get this straight for those of you that aren't used to this situation. Because if you've been here a very long time, you'll know that we've met situations like this before and we managed to cope with them. But many of you who have met situations like this before and they've wrecked your families. The difference is that all of us can get together on this one and we can sort it out. Because, you know, I get pretty rough when it comes down to a situation like this. And I stop playing games with you. And I, you know, I really, I really put it on you. I'm not joking, this is too serious. I'm talking to you because I want you to hear every word I say. It was Dave who went drinking with Martin. And if your lack of attention goes anything towards helping to destroy him out there, because you're so jealous that he's getting the attention and the consideration instead of you, that was what you said about five minutes ago. I should be, I, you know, you'll really get me blowing my top. Because I'm not going to let you get into a position afterwards where you've done so much damage to yourself as well. Because you'll never live that down. Now, you particularly owe something. Now, you better start thinking what you can pitch in at this moment. Next morning, without a trace of a hangover, Martin tries to explain. Yeah, but there's times, you know, when you get depressed, you know, and you think everybody's against you. You think nobody likes you, and so... So you begin to hate yourself, you know. Do you reckon drink helps when you're feeling like that? Well, no, it doesn't make it any better. It just makes it worse, doesn't it, really? 
So why do you drink? I don't know, I suppose, because, you know, if I drink, you know, I suppose I'm making myself more and more, you know, because that's why I drink a hell of a lot, you know, and once I do so, you know. Yeah, makes me feel like you're slobbing and pissed. So it kind of confirms your own idea? Yeah, that's right, yeah. But do you like hurting yourself? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. And that's when you get stuck into the booze. Yeah, yeah. I know what I'm doing, you know. What about the community? I mean, do you feel that you're kind of letting them down? Well, I used to think that, you know. I, was, I suppose I thought that used to be, you know. But it does have a hell of an effect on some people, you know. Because, um, yeah, you don't want a fucking raving lunatic going around the place, do you? I mean, it frightens a lot of people. When you were a bit of a raving lunatic last night, you were roaring like a bull and knocking these five blokes about a bit on the grass outside. Yeah, well, it frightens a lot of people, doesn't it? I mean, because some people have been through some experiences, you know. You know, like the old man coming in and being pissed and beating up, you know, beating them up and that. What struck us last night was the way that they were genuinely concerned about you and not just frightened of you. Everybody seemed to be a bit very worried about you. Yeah, well, that's how it is, isn't it? It's all I do me being here, you know. A group of Pepper Harrow boys go rock climbing on the Isle of Arran. Every boy has the chance to go camping, canoeing or rock climbing several times a year. It's a holiday in a way, but the Pepper Harrow method of group meetings and discussion goes along as part of the equipment. You put a belay on that there. <laughs> Tony and Brian together rock tackle rock a steep rock. climb unsupervised. Both have a record of breaking and entering. Brian preferred shops, especially those with high back walls. Tony used to haunt his old school at night. Put a belay on, Brian. What's above here? Nothing much. Well, I think you're going around this crate here. Turn around this slab. Should I follow like this? Yeah. Up here. It would be foolish to assume that every juvenile cat burglar in the British Isles is at heart a frustrated mountaineer. But the almost gangland pleasures of taking risks and defying danger in the company of trusted companions of the same age offers even greater pleasures, it seems, than solitary law-breaking or wanton destruction. Though the need for such excitements may be the same. Um, yeah, it's, it's very similar. I think it's the same sort of feeling I get. Yeah. <clears throat> what about you, Tony? In a way, in a way it's connected, but I think... But what I gain from rock climbing, from climbing mountains, that there's that... There is that connection with, you know, the excitement and the danger, but there's a lot more to it. Like I, I like to climb, to climb with Brian, and you know, it's, it's something that I can do. It's something that I've got. At Pepper Harrow, there's a crisis. It concerns two boys: a new boy, John Bentley, an American, who's sitting in a back row. The other boy is Pete, who plays drums in the Pepper Harrow group. By common consent, he's considered not such a good musician or drummer as the American, who's the object of Pete's anger. But everybody knows of Pete's misery at home, where he's just spent a bad weekend, watching his family being torn apart by forces which he understands but can't control. I know a great many of the facts seen by Pete, but everybody else doesn't. So let's start with the facts and we'll end up with the feelings, if we're lucky. What actually happened? There's a, a chap called John Bentley that comes into this. Well, I don't think he does this. But, um, Pete was sort of using it as an excuse, I think. Because, I mean, I didn't want Stephen even before John came. So I don't know. Have you been thinking about it over the weekend, Pete? There's nothing wrong with you having the feelings that you have. You have them. That's reality. But there's quite a bit wrong with some of the negative ones that you have, with you wanting to hang on to them. 
You agree, really, don't you? Mm. Is there any way we can help you to talk about this? No. Have a good weekend. Yeah, great. That's what you said after the last time. You think it would help to say it about the weekend, too? Yeah. On Friday, you were talking about uh, wanting to rearrange John, John Bentley's nose. Um, and uh, I wasn't sure whether it was because you felt angry at him for coming into the community or because you felt angry for the situation that had developed in the group. I don't know. And uh, come back this morning, and you know, we're trying to see if we can sort something out about it and uh, there's several of us who know in fact that your weekend didn't go as you wanted it to. You all sort something out, you sort it out. I can leave me alone. Can't it was all bad, John. What? No, I'm talking to John. Do you know what it's all about? This? Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like I'm being used for a scapegoat and Pete's not even willing to talk about it. And I'm really getting pissed off. Stop it, stop it. Let go of me, man. Calm yourself down, Pete. Just calm yourself down, sit down. I don't want to be here. Well, I don't care whether you want to, you sit down and sort oh, no. that out first. No. Well, I'm sorry, that's the only way. Now sit down. Yeah, you better get that attended to now, John. Well, we've got a vehicle on the road, because you'll need that stitching. Okay, come on then, Pete. Come on, you had a hell of a difficult weekend. You told us all about it last night. There are a dozen people here, Pete, that could ask you a whole series of questions and get one-word answers from you because they know what it's all about. But that's not going to do any good to you. Let's have it from you, mate. No. Come on, just fucking... No, come on. Peter, it just isn't acceptable that you behave in this damaging fashion and that everybody just has to accept it. Mm -hmm. I'm very sorry if I'm being damaging. Just fucking leave me alone. Well, I believe that you are sorry too. But um, I'm afraid, you know, we don't stop like that. Well, you're going to have to, you're going to say a thing. Well, how come you're going to go on damaging people then? Well, that's why you have to say something, because we have to get it sorted out. Because you won't stop hurting people otherwise, will you? Uh, I asked him if he thought his mother intends to injure people. What do you mean she tries her best? Succeeded with you this weekend. Succeeded in injuring you. And who else? No, no, no. No, no. Do you think you could try and explain why, Pete? Did she come up yesterday? That's my sister's 30th birthday. Yeah. Yeah. For the last sort of two weeks, we've been. Phoning my nan, my nan up every day, you know. You know saying they, <coughs> they've roughly been in all this. And my nan's been ill for the last two weeks. You know, my mum keeps <coughs> the body all the time. And she came up yesterday. And 
It's my granddad's birthday. Come Do you think Martin getting drunk on Friday was in any way similar to this situation with you this morning? Well, can you, can you tie the two things together, particularly for those people that don't understand what this is all about, really? Why is it similar? Because he's Martin, he's nothing, nothing like you. Similarity between you and Martin. The way in which you, some of the mistakes you make, are similar. Yeah. Do you think you can sort this morning's situation out? Because that's a damn sight easier than the one at home, isn't it? Do you think you can make some effort after this to get this morning sorted out? <coughs> so we've got to finish. This method of handling violence in a community raises some questions. Pete split open the right eyebrow of one of the staff who got in the way of his attack on John Bentley, who was innocent. It is true that Pete was in a condition of impotent but burning misery about his family. But if he suffers no punishment for his exhibition of violence, won't he always feel entitled to hit first and talk later? Yes, if that were what happens. But you see, it's this question of you, you use the word punishment. Um, we don't really feel that punishment is... Uh, appropriate in this situation. Um, I think if they were violent and nobody made any comment, nothing happened, and they were simply free to be violent again whenever they pleased, then what you suggest would follow, naturally. Uh, but if you consider what happened this morning, Peter broke down and cried, and he was crying because his awareness was sharper than ever of the gulf between how he often behaves and how he wants to behave how he wants to behave, to be acceptable to his grandmother, whose love is the one really secure, valuable, worthwhile thing he's got in his life, and how desperately bad he feels when he's aware that yet again he's fallen below that standard, that if he could be like his grandfather, whom he immensely admired, that would be good. And this discussing afterwards of his violence is bringing into focus the ways in which he is still unable to live up to these ideals. He's very idealistic, really. And yet, you know, people might say that if he hasn't got sufficient good manners or sufficient self-control to behave himself, then that's his fault and nobody else's and he should be corrected and punished and made to behave. If you're looking for the sources of Peter's um, lack of control, then you look at the forces that have operated in his life, the um, insecurity that follows when father walks out and you never hear from him again, and mother drowns her sorrows in the bottle, and grandmother and grandmother, grandfather, who are still loving, are nevertheless not there because they live somewhere else, and then grandfather 
is run down by a drug addict who's high and in charge of a car. And um, stepfathers float in and out of the picture and are not stable figures and are not in any case accepted. And one has to wonder then, where is this boy going to get the raw materials out of which he should build this strong character which will enable him not to be violent or unacceptable or whatever. And he is using the strength that he had from his grandparents and the strength that he finds here in the relationships he has here. If you're allowed to get away with this kind of thing, Pete, and it's kind of talked over and there's no physical chastisement, do you think that you'll kind of get into the habit of slogging people when you feel like it? Or is it something that, that you reckon they'll cure you of? Well, when I was at home, before I come here, I used to um, fight quite a lot. I think that's the second fight I've had, I've, I've had since I've been here. So I think I've quite done quite a lot. It's not a thing I come around doing <laughs> normally. Yeah. In other words, it's not a side of you that you uh, particularly enjoy. No, I hate it. I can't stand fighting. I think it's a disgusting thing. Really? Yeah. But sometimes a lot of things get on top of you. Yeah. You just can't control it. That's what I'm here for, to control things. Yeah. I think I'm doing quite well so far. I hope I'm anyway. What does it actually mean to you, the idea of a therapeutic community? Well, I don't really know what therapeutic means, for a start off, right? But I know, I know what this place means to me, you know. As been, you know I know what this place means to me, you know. What's important about it to you? What well, do you reckon is, is, is important about this place? Um, well, first of all, you get the things that you need, right, you know. I mean, you get the things that you need, like, you know, the basic things of life, you know, love, caring for, and things like this, you know. The places that you just don't, things that you just don't get in any other establishment, you know. People just care for you, you know, and people are willing to, uh, to know, you know, willing to talk to you and understand you, and you know, people treat you like an individual, you know. But do you believe that because they've told you about it, or have you actually had that experience that they do love you and they do care for you and they do treat you? Well, if they didn't, I wouldn't be here now because I'm here of my own accord, right? And if they didn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here now. I'd, I'd be up the road home again. I might as well be at home again. Because <laughs> you know, I'm here in my own will, you know, I don't have to be here. So that's the only reason why I stayed on, you know. The success of the Pepper Harrow experiment has not yet been proved. Its value must be judged by the boys' survival out in the big world which originally failed them when they were children. You're going to have to leave this place one day, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, sure. Do you dread the idea of going back to the outside world after Pepper Harrow because this is a very nice place to live? Yeah, it's nice, but you've got to face reality. There is someone living outside it. You've got to go out there one day, so you sort of build yourself up for it after a while. I think you just sort of work up to it. And I think when you're ready to leave, you're ready to leave. You know, you can live in that world that's outside. Can you imagine yourself ever caring about people out there in the same way that you care about the individuals in this community? Uh, I think I care more for some people out there, mum and dad and kids sort of thing, than I do for people there. Already? But, um, yeah, I always have done. Mm -hmm. but, you know, that's uh, it's a blood relationship, you know. You, you're bound to anyway. But what about the people where you used to nick things from them and break and uh, enter? And Do you think, think you're going to care a bit more uh, about them in, you know, in the abstract? I think you'll sort of feel more for them than, you know, you just used to think, well, I'll go out and nick someone's bread, don't matter who it is, you know. I ain't got none, so I'll have theirs. And then you used to... Uh, no, I think I'd sort of go out and I'd, uh, you know, I'd think, well, I can't take their bread, you know, it's not mine. It's their money. Now, if you, you can't go out and work and earn none, that's rough luck, you know. You've got no money for the week. It's a it big goes. change, isn't it? Yeah, it's a large change, but I think you're going to, you, this is what Pepper does for you, you know.